Well, now back to the Fed and its decision to continue purchasing $600 billion worth of treasuries through June. Joining us right now are Vince Reinhardt. He's former director of monetary affairs at the Fed, now a resident scholar at AEI. Also with us, Michael Clardy. He's head of U.S. interest rate strategy at RBC Capital Markets, one of 18 primary dealers that trade directly with the Fed. Gentlemen, great to have you here with Matt and myself. Vince, let's kick it off uh, with you. You support QE2. You think everything that the Fed is doing is, is right on target? I support the principle of quantitative easing. The unemployment rate's nine and three quarters percent. Inflation's low and falling. The central bank should use its balance sheet. They're having some problems on the execution. Uh, market participants are really worried whether or not they will actually do all the Q, uh, quantitative easing. And part of that has been some communications problems. And Michael, I know you say that there are some real costs to QE. Why don't you lay them out for us? Right. I think that uh, quantitative easing is going to make the exit very, very difficult for the Fed. Um, you know, when it comes time to tighten rates, uh, the swollen balance sheet will be rather hard to unwind. Uh, big uh, political blowback from a lot of the uh, steps the Fed has talked about um, for exiting policy. That plus uh, reduced liquidity in the Treasury market, I think that those costs, unless we're getting clear benefits from QE2, uh, not worth doing. What about... Uh and Vince, maybe you can answer this. Uh, John Boehner has been concerned about a possible asset price bubble coming from this. Obviously, a lot of people blame uh, Alan Greenspan's Fed for the whole housing uh, mess that we got into as far as asset inflation there getting out of control. Is it concerned now? Uh, you look, the Fed is a serial bubble blower, right? Uh, the channel of monetary policy influences through markets. If many of the standard avenues of policy influence, including through banks and their effects on, on loan supply, are blocked, there aren't many other things the Fed can do. What it can do is put downward pressure on Treasury, treasury interest rates and support a search for riskier assets. That's what it's doing. That's the form of stimulus it takes. Quantitative easing has risks associated with it. And I agree completely that some of the execution problems the Fed has has, has increased the risks, including of a messy exit. But right now, it's the only game in town. What do you think, Michael? I mean, if people are searching for riskier assets, they're getting out of treasuries, and as a result, you see uh, interest rates going up there, which isn't helpful, really, to the economic recovery, is it? Right. Well, we, we actually have seen slightly brighter numbers, uh, economic data coming out recently. So, you know, that's been a contributor to the, uh, the treasury sell-off. That said, this recovery is, is still quite modest by uh, normal standards. After a recession as deep as we've had, you would normally expect to see growth rates of about 7% coming out. You know, the, uh, the tax cut package and, and some of the other measures look like we're going to be a little bit above 3% growth. Uh, so better reduces the odds of a double dip, but far from anything that's going to generate inflationary pressure. Let, let me ask you, Vince, I mean, we, we've... Can, can I just address that, Matt, Please, for please, sec? please. Sure. So, no doubt, this is a slow expansion by post-war historical experience, but that's not the right set of comparators. My wife Carmen and I did a paper for the Jackson, Fed Jackson Hole Conference in uh, August that compared this recovery to those following severe financial crises of the past century. After the 15 severe financial crises, economies tend to grow a point and a half slower for the entire decade after the crisis than they did before. We should expect slower growth, a higher unemployment rate than the standard post-war yep. recovery. But the idea that, that, that's, and, that's the cards. And we, we covered that paper when you, when you wrote it, a fantastic work. But right. the idea is that we want to avoid that, right? I mean, Ben Bernanke is trying to get out of that scenario. Uh, too late for that. An important part about it is, is denial. We still have a policy of forbearance. We've got 22.5% of mortgages underwater. We've got holes in, in financial institutions' balance sheets because we still haven't addressed the problem of the housing market and, and underwater mortgages. You know, Michael, these are good points. I mean, I think it's interesting. I mean, things certainly feel a lot better. You look at a lot of the data points, they are improving, but there are still a lot of significant problems housing take it, unemployment. Um, is there something more that could be done, or do you think the Fed, as, as Vince points out, is kind of the only game in town here? It's the only one that's got maybe some tools left in its tool belt. 
Well, we, we are seeing the stimulus package um, from the administration. And, you know, again, the problem with the Fed is what are the rewards of QE versus the, the costs of QE? Um, I think that, uh, you know, QE fails on a cost benefit uh, analysis. And, you know, it's just a question of if, if you can't do that much to help, um, are you better off, you know, just sitting and waiting, or are you better off doing something that the cost will be higher than the benefits? And let me ask you, Vince, to respond to what Michael said about rewards versus costs uh, for, for QE2. He is saying that it isn't worth the money. No, Michael's exactly right. You have to do a cost-benefit analysis. On the cost side, uh, you do worry that it'll make the exit harder. You do worry that the, the Fed is facilitating the bad behavior of politicians by being willing to fund part of the deficit. You do worry about the signals it sends to our foreign official purchases. On the benefit side, that's what Chairman Bernanke uh, listed in the clip, puts downward pressure on rates. And, and remember, a lot of the rally up in until the November meeting was importantly related to the expectation of quantitative easing. Rates have backed up, but they're still lower than they were a year ago. That, that's some benefit of quantitative easing. And, and, and I think ultimately the biggest benefit the Fed officials saw was they are seen as acting. If you think they're being criticized now, suppose they were doing nothing over the last last three months, then they'd be criticized from the other side. A central bank's got to act when there's so much resource slack and so much downside risk to inflation. Michael, is Vince right? When there is so much downside risk, so much still slack in the economy, doesn't the Fed have to do something? Uh, again, if they, it really is, if they think that the, the rewards significantly outweigh the costs, um, but I do think those costs are significant. In part, one of the costs is by seeing interest rates go up in the face of, uh, of the QE2 program, uh, you know, that does hurt Fed cred credibility a little bit. Um, it, there is some damage to the institution um, from this, this policy. So, again, I, I just think that the calculus on cost benefits goes the other way. I mean, Vince, isn't there some point in this process that we say enough is enough and we need to let the cycle kind of play its way out? Or is it just nobody wants to feel any pain? And I shouldn't say that because a lot of folks have felt a lot of pain when it comes to losing jobs and losing value, whether it's in the, the financial markets or in their house. But at some point, don't we need to back off and let the cycle play its way out. Sure, I think I think there is an argument for creative destruction, for allowing the losses to pass through. And indeed, I think it's not an issue of the Fed, it's the issue of our, our regulatory authorities um, forcing financial institutions to accept the losses from the bad mortgage loans they made. We're going to have to come to grips with, with that at some point. The mm -hmm. sooner we can, the better. But there's no reason for the Fed to keep, keep the growth of demand growing more slowly than it would okay. otherwise need. Okay. Yeah, we, we've got to leave it. I know this is a discussion week that could certainly go on for much longer, but we do appreciate uh, both of your times uh, today. Vince Reinhardt and Michael Clardy. Guys, thanks so much.